so hello good morning everyone uh, yeah good morning welcome to the open infra summit so i am nisha uh, meet my colleague bharadwaj and uh, vishwajit so we are here from tokyo uh, both of us work at line corporation and uh, my colleague vishwajit works at kpmg so our talk today is about beginners so apart from coming from tokyo one thing that is common between three of us is that we have just started our career we are new grads and one year into our uh, cloud career. So this is literally a beginner's journey of one year of operating production level private cloud using OpenStack and managed Kubernetes. So let's start. So this is the topic overview. I start with a beginner's view followed by our, uh, followed by Lines Cloud and our first task, our work, challenges, the current project that we are working and a little bit about Kubernetes. If I start from very basic, so what is cloud computing? I think all of you are aware about it. So just a slide about cloud computing and the perks because of which we are sitting here today. So this is the layers of cloud computing and I think uh, I did not need to mention that OpenStack and Kubernetes lie at the very bottom level, that is the IAS level. So, and there's a simple analogy about the lease, car, taxi, bus. It's fun to think about layers of cloud computing in that way. So yeah, what is OpenStack? So OpenStack is a tool to manage and create small or large cloud, public or private cloud. And um, this explains the scale of OpenStack and why all of you here are <laughs> in the Open Infra Summit and majorly focusing on OpenStack today. So these are a uh, few of major OpenStack components that we also work on. Uh, and let's get to the more good part. So what is Verda? Verda is the name of Line's private cloud. So Line is basically where me and Bharadwaj work. And we work in the cloud team, which is the Verda team. So Verda provides managed services. There are a few of them. To give you a rough overview of the scale of Verda, so these are the number of physical servers, bare metal servers, hypervisors, and virtual machines at Verda as of Jan 2023. I think uh, that's uh, pretty much. So this explains the resource provisioning at Verda. So our end users are basically line developers, and we are there at the infra team. So, yeah. yeah. So let me uh, dive deeper into our first task, is the personal Verda. So as beginners, when we started, we wanted some playground to test and work around with OpenStack. So there were uh, multiple options, for example, DevStack but it comes with its pros and cons. So at Line, we have personal Verda. And what is personal Verda is basically we create our personal OpenStack cluster using Ansible. And if you look closely at the diagram, it's basically the dev cluster hypervisors. Are, are like there are VMs on top of these hypervisors, which we configure as personal cluster hypervisors. And then we use this environment as our personal Verda to create and play around with VMs. So it's fun to think that it's basically a cluster on top of a cluster. And that is how we started. Ap apart from this uh, first playground, we use personal Verda for personal test environment before we move on to the actual staging and production environments. So that's uh, pretty much about personal Verda. Next, we dive uh, more deeper into the work we have done over the past few months. So I will talk a little bit about Nova. Nova is uh, one of the OpenStack components. And these are two features that we contributed, one of them being the user script feature for PM. So PM is a physical machine. It's a Lines original Nova bare metal driver. And the user script feature actually OpenStack provides it for VMs. It is that you can, as you can see in command number one, the, you can provide a user script which will be run at the VM boot up. So we exactly uh, do this feature for the physical machines. And the second one is scheduling VM on specified aggregate. So if we specify an aggregate, as you can see in the command number B, we can schedule a VM in the specified aggregate uh, that is achieved by adding a new filter. And yeah, so it matches the key value pair. So that is pretty much about Nova. Next, I would like to hand over the mic to my colleague uh, Bharadwaj to explain more details. Thank you, Nisha. Uh, I would like to continue on the same topic of the work that we have done at Line. Uh, so a major part of our time has been uh, dedicated uh, to uh, containerizing various uh, services in OpenStack. As we all know that many of these services 
uh, they run parallelly on the same uh, hypervisor, uh, be, it the, be it the controller node, be it the controller node or the uh, compute nodes. Uh, and uh, with running many uh, applications on the uh, services on the same hypervisors, we know that it can cause many such problems like the, uh, the package dependency and many other such problems. So uh, in line, we have managed to uh, containerize our uh, neutron agent that we call as L2 isolate agent, and uh, we have used Podman for the same. So that has enabled us to use uh, different packages versions independently. So that's uh, one part of it. Uh, I would like to move on to the next section, uh, which are the challenges. Uh, this is a bit more interesting. Uh, as beginners, of course, we uh, all face a lot of challenges when we uh, start with start working with any tool, for that matter. So uh, within OpenStack as well, uh, firstly and the foremost, uh, there are a lot of open RC files, uh, as you all must be aware. And uh, same was the case with us. And you know, switching between many of them could be difficult, and at times uh, it takes time as well. Uh, so there are a few tricks, uh, which are basic uh, bash RC scripts and uh, similar shell commands, which, but it does make your hel uh, life a lot easier uh, using them. Moving on, uh, the next set of challenges uh, uh, we face at uh, our, our company and in our team is when we try to deploy our changes uh, to the large number of hypervisors that we have in, uh, in our company, uh, in our cloud. Uh, usually it takes few hours for uh, any, any small changes to deploy to our, uh, all our compute nodes. So to uh, make it, of course we cannot completely eliminate the time factor, but we can always uh, reduce the time to a certain extent. And we have used some steps like uh, using smaller playbooks in Ansible or handlers instead of running the entire task file or dividing the, uh, the set of compute hosts that we have into smaller subgroups and uh, using them in the um, Ansible host file. Moving on to uh, a, a bit more uh, technical challenges that uh, usually we face in our day-to-day -day life. Uh, our one such in for in, uh, example, uh, uh, error like fail to allocate network, which you might usually see when you try to uh, do an open, uh, OS server show. Uh, usually for such errors, uh, we try to get the tab device ID of the VM, uh, of, the, of the interface for the VM, uh, we, and you can use the following command, the neutron port list command. And uh, from there, you can, all, uh, you can get the tab device ID, and uh, you can always go on to the compute node and uh, grab, uh, grab the tab ID and check for more details. So uh, once you have the tab device ID ready, uh, you can move on to different scenarios, which could be the possible reason behind the error that you're seeing. So one such could be that the Nova API is failing to receive any interface attachment info from the Neutron server. Usually in such cases, the Rabbit, the messaging driver, be it RabbitMQ or any other driver that you're using, Usually it, it has stopped working or it is not working as intended. So always check that. And uh, the next scenario could be that the tap interface that has been, uh, 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 that is usually created is, hasn't been created on the compute node. So you can do the following checks on the compute node, like check for the neutron agent status and such and such. Another similar issue which is uh, more or less, uh, is more common is like the IP is assigned to the VM but it is not usually pingable. In such cases, usually the error lies at the DHCP level. The DHCP server, like DNS mask, could be uh, could have been could have stopped on the compute node. So you can also use TCP dump to check the uh, communication between the VM and the DHCP server. Also, another uh, problem could be with the open the security group rules. Usually, we always forget to uh, check these. So uh, that could be one of the reason. And here are some of the tools which are more or less commonly known, which could be used. Moving on uh, to the current work that we are uh, doing, uh, so we have uh, tried to we have we have man uh, like we have decided to uh, upgrade from the older version that we were using uh, in our cluster to a newer Z version, and for many uh, understandable reasons, and for the same to achieve the same we uh, we try to uh, we have set up a, a test cluster with the newer version Z version uh, before actually implementing in the production cluster, and for the same. These are some of the steps which are usually followed uh, in, uh, in such upgrade tasks. So we take the upstream uh, Z code and we add it to it, uh, to it our patches and uh, our code, right? And we make sure that it passes all the unit tests and functional tests uh, in our local environment. And uh, using the modified code, we uh, install the various OpenStack components in all the respective uh, hypervisors, the, like the compute nodes or the control nodes or the network nodes and uh, also modify the uh, configuration files uh, as Z uh, version has its own set of con configuration files and then make sure that the end-to-end -end, uh, functionality works like resource provisioning works. Yeah, uh, the, 
challenges that we faced uh, during this project, uh, there were a, lo a lot many, but uh, these are some of the uh, prominent ones, like uh, many of the configurations have been deprecated uh, from the older version to the new newer versions like Z. Also, a lot of uh, new newer uh, packages uh, like the following are required on the compute nodes, uh, which have to be installed by uh, by either by yourself manually or by any uh, deployment tool. And also, the Linux version had to be upgraded to uh, re more recent versions uh, to enable many of the network features that the newer Z version offers. Yeah, so uh, that's more or less the uh, challenges, a uh, few of them, of the many that we had faced. Moving on, I would now request my uh, friend Vishwajit Kumar to take on. Hi. Uh, yeah, so my name is Vishwajit and I work at uh, KPMG Ignition Tokyo. Uh, today I will be sharing my learnings of uh, Azure Kubernetes service uh, because I use it in my daily work and how my team uh, uses its features. So some, some prominent features of Kubernetes service are uh, that it has a fully managed control plane so we don't need to manage and orchestrate the control plane itself. Uh, we can uh, schedule auto repair and auto upgrade for the nodes so we don't need to take care of the underlying uh, in nodes infrastructure. Uh, it has inbuilt support for uh, monitoring and SIEM solution uh, offered by Azure. Uh, AKS has, uh, is deeply integrated with uh, managed databases and storage services. Uh, AKS has uh, easy network setup uh, with Azure application gateway, access control list, and firewall. Uh, AKS is also uh, deeply integrated with Azure Active Directory and it provides uh, identity and access management controls. So, uh, now, how do we uh, use it in our infra uh, infrastructure team? So my platform team is ISO 27001 and 27017 certified uh, because we have audit and some strict, uh, very high confidential data. So multiple teams uh, build their containerized application on top of our platform. So we use a hub and spoke model for networking. Uh, this allows us to enforce network policies uh, platform wide and gives us more visibility into how the network flow is happening for each of the applications. Uh, data security was kept in mind while building the platform and there is a deep level of data segregation for each of the applications that run on the platform. So we maintain this platform as infrastructure as code. Uh, it helps us to deploy and provision a new infrastructure, uh, a new environment uh, within an hour. And uh, this helps our developers to uh, fast iterate and prototype. So using Azure, we were able to solve data residency issues where we were able to keep the data in the region where the application was running. So this is from my side, and that's all from our presentation. If anyone has uh, any questions, we have one minute left, I guess. So that's all. Thank you.